Hi, I'm Dan and I work at Fanatic Bike. We're known for helping people create gorgeous custom builds with some of the best mountain bike brands on the planet. We've separated all the parts of a mountain bike into six different systems, which we're gonna break down in this series. With a good understanding of how all these components come together, you'll be able to confidently configure your own dream build. So stay tuned and join us in understanding mountain bikes. In this first episode, we're gonna explore the foundation of the mountain bike, the frame and the suspension. These components are the foundation for how the bike is gonna fit the rider and handle on the trail. Let's start by exploring the frame. Viewed from the side, you can see that a frame consists of two triangles, the front triangle and the rear triangle. Three points that connect the rider to the bike are located on the front triangle. They are the bottom bracket, where your pedals are, the head tube, where your handlebars are, and your seat tube, where your seat comes out of. Now, the distances between these three points are crucial in determining how a bike is gonna handle. So we'll explore those in a little bit. But the pieces that connect those points on the frame are the top tube, which is named because it's on the top of the frame, and the down tube, because it goes down from the head tube to the bottom bracket. We already talked about the seat tube. With that understanding, let's take a look at some of the most important aspects of bike geometry and fit. You've probably heard of the terms reach and stack. They tell you how far horizontally and vertically your hands are from your feet. They're really important to look at when you're talking about how a bike is gonna feel while descending because they don't involve where your saddle is, which does not come into play when you're descending and standing up on your pedals. The next point is seat tube angle. Now, if you look at a frame, you might think that the angle of the seat tube and this horizontal line of the ground is pretty small, but that's not actually where it's, where it's measured from in most geometry charts. Instead, you'll see effective seat tube angle, and that's measured between the point at the bottom bracket where your feet are centered around and your saddle, where it meets that reach line. So that is sort of a imaginary measurement, but it's what really comes into play when you're trying to figure out how far back over the rear wheel your body weight is. And lastly, another measurement that comes into play while you're seated is effective top tube. Again, this is not the actual length of your top tube, but is measured from the center of your head tube to where it intersects with your saddle in a horizontal line. Now, again, this is gonna come into play because it'll dictate how stretched out you feel when you're seated pedaling, it determines how far your hands are from your bum. Now, attached to the front triangle is the rear triangle, which on hardtails is welded to the front triangle, but on full suspension bikes is its own separate unit that is attached to the front triangle by the shock linkage that we have here. The two sides that aren't the seat tube are the seat stay, which on a hardtail is called that because it stays the seat tube or holds it up. Uh, then we have the chain stay, which is often referred to in geometry charts because it dictates the distance from the center of your bottom bracket to your rear axle and therefore the distance of the rear end of the bike. Now, to give you an example of why all these numbers are worth considering, let's look at the current trend of giving bikes a longer reach. This is pushing your hands further away from the center of the bike, and it's making a longer bike, which gives us more downhill stability and speed is why they're doing it. But it also, on the flip side, when we're climbing, puts our hands further out in front of us and uh, kind of creates a bit of a wandery feel because our weight isn't as centered over the front wheel as it used to be. So to counteract that, they've started to steepen the seat tube angles, again, bringing our weight back further towards the front wheel and creating a more comfortable seated pedaling position than a really stretched out long one would give you. That covers the frame and leads us nicely to our first suspension component, the rear shock. They are what make full suspension bikes so capable and so cool. They work to give us more traction, make the ride more comfortable, and improve braking, all by letting the rear wheel move up and down and away out of bumps and rocks and jumps. 
Um, there's two types or two components to a rear shock. There is the spring, of which there's two types, and the damper, which I'll explain a little bit in a second. We have the first type of spring is a coil spring, which we're all familiar with. They're found in everything, and that's just a metal spring. Or more commonly these days, an air spring, which is pretty simple too. It's just a compressed chamber of air. They allow you to absorb energy and then return it. But if we just had a spring, you would have a pogo stick of a bike. So we also have a damper, which lets us control how quickly the spring moves. Now, if you want to learn more about all that and how to set these up and a little bit more about these terms, you can check out the video we did recently on how to set up your mountain bike suspension, which I will link to. But for now, we'll move right along. The last piece of our suspension puzzle is, of course, the fork. Now, like the shock, it also has a spring, typically on the left side here and a damper typically on the right side there they can be coil springs with a metal coil or more typically an air spring that you would use a shock pump to adjust now they are housed in the stanchions which are the sliding element of the fork they slide in the lowers which is this whole piece down here that holds the dropouts which is where your wheel attaches the fork arch which helps to stabilize things and then they are fused to the fork crown. Lastly, we have the steer tube. This is what goes through the frame. Our handlebars attach to the top of this and allow us to steer our bike. Now, the way that they inter the fork interacts with our frame is with our headset, which since you can't see it is kind of abstract, but it's basically just two bearings, one on the bottom and one on the top. that the fork meshes with the frame and turns smoothly. That finishes up our fork, which I have gone ahead and installed on the frame and brings us to one of the most widely cited geometry measurements in mountain biking, head tube angle. Now, this is simply the angle between the fork and the ground, so right here, and gets talked about a ton. A larger angle, like this, is typically called a steeper head tube angle, and a smaller angle, like something on this bike, is called a slack head tube angle. Now, it comes into play a lot because a slack head angle like this, you could tell that an obstacle coming down the trail is gonna, the fork is gonna be able to move up and out of the way more easily than if it was a steeper head angle. It would not be hitting it at the right angle of attack. So bikes oriented for downhill speed typically have a slacker head tube angle, whereas bikes meant for climbing, cross country, endurance race bikes typically have a steeper head tube angle. If you wanna learn about more of how that interacts with the bike and how it changes how a bike handles, it's a lot more than what I just described, but it's outside the scope of this video. So check out our blog post, which examines that relationship between head angle, uh, wheel size, and fork offset. I'll link to it right there. That head angle does determine where our front axle sits, which brings us to the last geometry measurement I wanted to talk about, and it's a pretty important one in so far as determining how a bike handles and that's wheelbase. That is simply the horizontal distance between the front axle and the rear axle. Now, it's important because longer bikes for a given size tend to be more stable at speed, uh, feel more sort of confidence inspiring in like chunky, chundery terrain, but a bit less nimble, harder to get around tight switchbacks, stuff like that, versus a shorter wheelbase, which like I just mentioned, does feel more nimble, easier to change direction, get around real tight corners, but will buck you around a little bit more when you're going really, really fast, especially on rockier or rootier terrain. That does conclude part one of understanding mountain bikes. And now that we have a firm grasp of the chassis and suspension of our mountain bike, we'll move on to the components. In part two, we'll talk about the drivetrain. If you have any questions about any of the terms or concepts I covered today, definitely let us know in the comments below. If you like these videos, please subscribe to our channel. 
And while you're at it, check us out at fanaticbike.com. Thanks for watching, y'all. We'll see you next time.